Uh, the scripture reading this morning comes from Luke chapter 2, verses 1 through 20. Um, again, that's Luke chapter 2, verse 1 through 20. And I'll be reading from the New King James Version. And it came to pass in those days that a decree went out from Caesar Augustus to all the world should, that all the world should be registered. This census first took place when Quirinius was still governing Syria. So all, so all went to be registered, everyone to his own city. Joseph also went up from Galilee, out of the city of Nazareth, into Judea, to the city of David, which is called Bethlehem, because he was of the house and lineage of David, to be registered with Mary, his betrothed wife, who was with child. So it was that while they were there, the days were complete for her to be delivered. And she brought forth her firstborn son, and wrapped him in swaddling cloths, and laid him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. Now there were in the same country shepherds living out in the fields, keeping watch over their flock by night. And behold, an angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which will be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you, that you will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on the earth peace, goodwill towards men. So it was, when the angels had gone away from them into heaven, that the shepherds said to one, of, to one another, Let us now go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has come to pass, which the Lord has made known to us. And they came with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the babe lying in a manger. Now when they had seen him, they made widely known the saying which was told them concerning this child. And all those who heard it marveled at those things which were told them by the shepherds. But Mary kept all these things and pondered them in her heart. Then the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all things that they had heard and seen as it was told them. Good morning. Clicker's down here. I gotta grab it. Sorry. We're going to continue our 52-week series that we've been doing mostly on Sunday nights uh, this morning as we'll have a little bit of a, a different service tonight. We'll have a, a shorter devotional type lesson about joy tonight. Hope that you'll come for that. And then we're actually going to have a report on the, the Haiti missions tonight. Steve Cox is going to do that for us. So I hope that you will uh, make it back for, for both of those tonight as it will be a blessing for us to talk about the joy that we need to have as Christians and the joy that we can have, thankfully, as Christians and also have the opportunity to learn about uh, the joy that's happening in Haiti and maybe some of the help that they need in Haiti to have uh, more joy in this life. Uh, this morning we're talking about the most important event that's ever happened in human history. No pressure, right? Uh, this is the, the absolutely uh, most important thing that, that has ever happened. This, this event changed not only eternity for many people, for millions of people perhaps, but it has changed the world. The world before Christ and the world after Christ uh, is a different place. Uh, because of, of the religion of Christianity, because of the, the teachings of Christianity, life has changed here on this earth in, in many ways, in, in some ways good. And, and of course, there have been those that have stood against it, and there have been difficulties because of it. But tonight, this morning, we're talking about the fact that unto us a child was born. Uh, and as we've been doing in our 52-week series on, on Wednesday night, we're going to talk about some of the the facts of this and, and some of the, the myths, or maybe fact versus fiction. What, what do we know about the, the birth of Christ? What does the, the Bible tell us about the birth of Christ? What does the Bible say what we need to do about the birth of Christ? What are some of the, the myths or the legends or what other people say outside of the Bible about did it really happen and how did it happen? And how can we explain uh, some of the things the Bible says about the birth of Christ. You know, I was thinking about, and we'll, we'll talk about this on, on Wednesday night, certainly. But if you think about, uh, I think about the, the crossing of the Red Sea and the Exodus. There are people that have, have been able to, at least in their minds, scientifically perhaps, or, or, or with weather, been able to explain that, that maybe there was a, a strong wind that, that came uh, across the, the land and, and, and blew the water back or, or blew a, a, a section of, of the sea open so that the, the Israelites could cross over on the dry ground. And, and maybe that's true. Maybe that's, maybe that's how God did it. We, we don't know exactly how God did many of the miraculous things that the Bible talks about. But you can't explain away the fact that Jesus was born of a virgin. That's a miracle. That's God. And, and there's, no, there's no explanation of that 
that you and I can comprehend except for God did that. So Wednesday night, we're going to talk about what does that mean? What does that look like? How do we explain that to people? How, how important is that? Uh, certainly this time of year, many people are thinking about the, the birth of Christ. And we're going to talk about that a little bit. Is, is that right? How should, we, how should we deal with that, with our, our family, our friends? How should we interact with people who, who uh, claim that, that the, the day Christmas, December 25th, is the, the birth of Christ? How, how should we address that? We'll talk about those things on Wednesday. But what I really want to talk about this morning is that we are thankful and we are blessed and it is the most important event perhaps in human history that ever happened that Jesus, the Son of God, was born. But just as important and, and tied in directly to that is that God came to die. This morning we're going to have three points. God came to die for all mankind. God came to die for me. And God came to die for you. Our first point this morning, again, is God came to die for all mankind. We're going to establish some facts, maybe reestablish, remind you of some facts. But, but again, remember, if, if this isn't real, if this didn't happen, then everything changes in our life. God came to die for all mankind. First of all, under this point, God. In John chapter 1, verse 1, and then verse 14, it says, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Verse 14 says, And the Word became flesh, and dwelt among us. And we saw His glory, glory as the only begotten from the Father, full of grace and truth. The Word was in the beginning with God, the Word was God, and later the Word put on flesh. That has to be, and we know, just, just from those two verses alone we would know, but certainly we know from, from the message of Scripture that that refers clearly to Jesus. God became Man, Paul writes to the Colossians, the, the, the church at Colossia, and says this in Colossians chapter 2, verses 8 through 10. See to it that no one takes you captive through philosophy and empty deception, according to the tradition of men, according to the elementary principles of the world, rather than according to Christ. He says there are a lot of ideas out there. There are a lot of thoughts out there about a lot of different things. But, but don't let those things take you away from the most important thing which is Christ. It says, it goes on to say, For in Him, in Christ, all the fullness of deity dwells in bodily form. And in Him you have been made complete, been made full, been made perfect. And He is the head over all rule and authority. In Jesus, this Word that became flesh, the fullness, the completeness of God put on flesh, put on what you and I have. It's important that Jesus makes the claim to be God, isn't it? You know, if Jesus had lived his life and, and as we had his words recorded in, in the Gospels and in other places, and if, and if he never made that claim, then that would raise some concerns for us, wouldn't it? But Jesus makes that claim. In the, the Gospel of John, he makes that claim at least four times in chapter 5, chapter 8, chapter 10, and chapter 20. And that's just in the Gospel of John in just four instances. But, but Jesus makes it clear that he claims to be equal with God. He claims that he and the Father are one, and he calls himself the Son of God. Turn to Philippians chapter 2. You're familiar with this passage, but I want us to uh, take a moment to, to consider this as we consider the fact that Jesus is God. Now, you and I probably take that for granted, but, but realize there are some people who claim to follow God, some people who claim to, to be uh, believers in, in Scripture that, that don't believe that Jesus is God. Turn to Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 7. Notice the illustration that you've, you've heard this, these verses many times before. He's talking about the attitude that we have, the, the approach to life that we have, the sacrificial living that we have. And notice that he's going to use an illustration, Paul is here in Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. And the illustration takes for granted the fact that Jesus is God. This verse is not about proving that Jesus is God. This verse is making an illustration of an application that you need to have in your life, and it takes for granted the fact that Jesus is God. Notice what it says, Philippians 2, verses 5 through 7. Have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself, taking the form of a bondservant and being made in the likeness of men. Notice he, he dwelt, he existed in the form of God, but he took on the form of man. He existed in the, the spiritual form of God, but he put on the fleshly form of man. And again, this, this verse is, is not at all about proving that Jesus, 
God becomes man, becomes flesh. It's taking for granted that fact and showing us that sacrifice. Again, I've said this before, and I'm always amazed by this fact. God, in Jesus, left heaven, the place where you and I are so desperately trying to get. And He left that place so that we could have that hope. You, you and I want to go to heaven. You want to go to heaven, don't you? Amen? You can do better than that, right? You want to go to heaven, don't you? Amen? Amen. I hope you do. I hope you want to go to heaven. And listen, God left heaven. We, we would never consider that, but that, that's the attitude that it's talking about here. He left perfection. He left a place where you and I desperately want to get, and He came here to this world with its pain and its difficulty and its stress and the sin that exists here. He left heaven, the place where you and I are all trying to get. He changed form from God to man. He made, was found in the likeness of man. God came to die for all mankind. Never forget, God became man. Creator became His creation. The fullness of God was born, as we just sang, in helpless babe. Colossians chapter 2 and verse 9. So God came. But he didn't just come. He didn't just come to, to check and see how things were going. He didn't just, you know, maybe like a, a supervisor at a plant comes down from his office above and, and comes to, to check out the line and making sure everything's running smoothly. God came specifically for a purpose, and that purpose was to die. If you continue in Philippians chapter 2, begin verses 7 and 8, it says, talking about Jesus, Jesus emptied himself. And another way you could say that, you could, he'd say, he laid aside his privileges as God taking the form of a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by be becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. God came to die, and he had to obey. He had to stick with that plan. It was God's, and therefore Jesus' plan to die. In Acts chapter 2, Peter is, is preaching the, the first gospel sermon on the day of Pentecost, and he says it this way in Acts 2 and verse 23, that Jesus was, quote, delivered by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God, and he goes on to say, to be nailed to the cross. It was predetermined. Predetermined before what? Well, Peter tells us that it was before the foundation of the world that it was determined. Before creation was ever created, God knew Jesus, God, would have to die and die on the cross. It was the foreknowledge of God. It was predetermined. It was the plan ahead of time, and God knew that it would happen. And Jesus is God, so that means that Jesus knew that it would happen. And here's a question maybe for Wednesday night. How much did Jesus know as a child? When did he come to the, the full knowledge of this plan? When did he recognize this fact? Maybe that's a, a question for Wednesday night, but, but no doubt about it. For many years, Jesus knew one day he would die a horrible death. And he came anyway, and he lived a perfect life in spite of knowing that. He knew it ahead of time, and he was a part of determining it ahead of time. Just hours before he is to die on the cross. And while Jesus knew the plan, he helped make the plan. We need to recognize that Jesus' death on the cross was a sacrifice. It was difficult. It was not easy. Hours before he is to die on the cross, he's to fulfill his purpose. He is to save the world. The reason that he came, the predetermined, foreknowledged plan of God. Hours before this, Jesus agonizes over this plan. Jesus agonizes over what he's going to have to do. You know what happens in the, uh, the Garden of Gethsemane. He's there and he's praying with his disciples and he asks them to pray with him and they can't. But, but in Luke's account, in Luke chapter 22 and verse 44, it tells us that he's, he's so stressed. He's under such agony and, and, and difficulty of, am, am, I, am I going to be obedient? Am I going to stick with the plan? Am I going to do what, what I came to do? And it says that his, his sweat became like drops of blood. But in Matthew's account, we see Jesus' heart. We see Jesus, what Jesus really wanted to do. In Matthew's account of the Garden of Gethsemane, every time that he, he prays that prayer, how does he end it? Not my will, but thy will be done. God, I know this is the plan. 
I know this is the plan because because I'm God. I was I was there when the plan was made. I was a part of making the plan. I, I know this is the, the way it's got to happen. I know this this has to happen, God. But my flesh that I have taken on is weak. I don't want to die this way, God, Father. I don't want to experience this pain that I know that is coming. And and you and I, because we we have Scripture, Jesus hadn't experienced it yet. We've never experienced anything like this, I would say, at least the vast majority of us, certainly, and and probably the vast majority of people on earth. But you know the pain that Jesus went through. The scourging. The crown of thorns that was driven down into his head. The blood that must have dripped down his face. The nails that pierced his hands and his feet. And the suffocation and death that he experienced. Extreme pain, and and he knows this. And he knows he's just hours away from it, and he is in agony. Jesus came to die for all mankind. John 3.16, most people know this verse, even if they're very not very religious at all. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Verse 17 goes on to say that, that Jesus did not come to judge the world, but that the world through him might be saved. Jesus came to die for everyone, not for me alone. Christians, it, it, sometimes it's, I don't know if it's complacency or or just the, the status quo of our lives. Sometimes we, we recognize and we appreciate that, that Christ died for us. But let's not forget that Jesus came to die for all mankind. Jesus came to die for your best friend. Amen? Jesus came to die for your worst enemy. At work, Jesus came to die for your, your favorite boss who always lets you slip by with the things, maybe turning in a little bit late. And Jesus came to die for that coworker that grates on your nerves every single day. Jesus came to die for your closest family member. And Jesus came to die for that family member that is the black sheep of the family. Jesus came to die for the nicest person in this world. And Jesus came to die for the worst villain in this world. God came to die for all mankind. We think about that and we appreciate that. And maybe if you're not a Christian, and maybe before you became a Christian, if you are one, you, you ask the question, God came to die for me? The, the, the lesson, the, the words that Stephen shared with us this morning, that, that we are impressed, that we're, we're amazed that God came to die for me? How amazing is that? Maybe, maybe we even, even doubt that in, in some ways. We recognize from Scripture that all mankind needs a Savior. I wrote up there Romans 3.23 and 6.23. Those, those verses clearly say it, but many, many other scriptures tell us that mankind needs a Savior, and all mankind needs a Savior. Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. That doesn't leave anyone else. That word all is pretty important. It's a short word, but it's very important, isn't it? All, everyone who has ever lived except for the Savior Jesus has sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And then Romans 6.23 tells us, What we deserve because of our sin. The wages of sin is death. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. Everyone who who has ever lived to age to recognize the the difference between right and wrong and to, to make the decision to choose wrong, everyone has sinned. And God came to die for everyone. All mankind needs a Savior, and there is only one Savior for all mankind. Turn to Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12, I encourage you to, if you, if you don't have this uh, verse marked in your book or written down somewhere where you can memorize it, I would encourage you to, to memorize it, mark it, recognize it, don't forget it. Acts chapter 4 and verse 12. It says, And there is salvation, listen, And there is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven that has been given among men by which we must be saved. Of all the great men and women of history, of all the great men and women in your life, there is only one person who has ever lived that can save us, and that's Jesus. There are a lot of people that that we would look up to and and admire in in our American history or in world history or in, in, in church history, in biblical history. We'd be impressed by them. We would love to meet them. 
You know, you, you see uh, games or, or, or have conversations with people. If you could, if you could have a, a meal with anyone uh, today, you know, alive or, or dead, past or present, who would, you, who would you have a meal with? Maybe a, a famous president, maybe a famous social activist, maybe a famous athlete. Those are all maybe worthy things. But there's only been one person, only one name that can save us. Only one being that has ever lived that can bring about salvation in our lives. Galatians 2.20, a familiar verse. I think we think about this verse, verse a lot when we think about Jesus. It says, I've been crucified with Christ, and it is no longer I who live, but Christ lives in me. And the life which I live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God. And sometimes I think we forget this very last part. Especially as we think about this question, I want you to think about this. God came to die for me. It says, I, the life which I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself up for me. Why did Jesus come to earth? Why did my Savior come to earth? Why did he choose a lowly birth? Because he loved me so. God loves you. And God loves your family. And God loves your neighbor. And God loves your friends. And God loves your enemies. God came to die for us. Thirdly, God came to die for you. I don't know if you've noticed the, uh, the punctuation, something that's important to, to remember as you're, you're looking at this. Those of you who are history or uh, English buffs or English teachers, these are things to, to, to recognize, right? God, God came to die for me? Question mark. Yes, God came to die for you. Why did God come to die for me? Because He loves you so. God came to die for you! Exclamation point. That's different, isn't it? Same words, almost. But a, a different punctuation, and it changes the entire meaning of it. In Hebrews chapter 4, if you want to turn there, Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it talks about uh, who Jesus is for us because of His sacrifice, sacrificial life and death and resurrection. Hebrews 4, 14 through 16, it says, We have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, Therefore, let us hold fast our confession. For we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weakness. Let's stop there. Jesus can sympathize with our weakness. Why is that? Because He's passed through the heavens. What does that mean? Because He left heaven and He came to earth. He was in the form of God, but He took on the form of man. Except for sin, Jesus has experienced something similar to everything you've ever experienced. Your highest highs and your lowest lows. And Jesus knows how difficult temptation is. Jesus was tempted, we know after he was baptized, he was taken into the wilderness and uh, you know, fasted for 40 days. And then after his, his 40 days of fasting, Satan comes to him and tempts him. But, but make, make no mistake, Satan tempted Jesus every day just like Satan tempts you every day. And I believe that the only way that that sacrifice of Jesus could have meant anything... Was if, was if there was the possibility of him sinning. If Jesus could not sin, then his sacrifice isn't that much of a sacrifice. His life isn't really all that impressive. But because he had the ability, because he was man, he was human, he did put on flesh, he did have the ability. That's why it says he had to be obedient to the plan. He had to stick with the plan. He had to follow the plan. In some way, it would have been possible for Jesus not to have done that, to have sinned. But because He did, He can sympathize with our weaknesses, our spiritual weaknesses. Not that He failed, but He knows how difficult it is not to fail. And also our physical weaknesses. It says, But one Jesus, who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. That's very important. He didn't sin. He knows what it's like to be tempted, but He doesn't know what it's like to be, sin to be sinful. Therefore, because of that, let us draw near with confidence to the throne of grace so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in a time of need. Because of Jesus, we can have confidence. But notice what we can have confidence in. It's not so much that because I'm a Christian, I, I, I've got everything figured out. I've got everything smooth. I, I'm, the, I'm the best person that there is. I, I know exactly what I'm doing. He says, because of Jesus, we can be confident to receive grace and mercy. Well, why do you receive grace and mercy? Why do you need grace and mercy? Because you're not perfect. 
because you still fail, because you're not living everything right. We need grace and mercy because we have times of need. And because of Jesus, we can be confident that we will receive, receive that blessing. In Hebrews chapter 2, verses 2 and 3, it talks about the Old Testament. It talks about the, the Word delivered through angels. And it, it says there uh, that, "...for if the Word spoken through angels proved unalterable, and every transgression and disobedience received a just penalty..." What's, what's that talking about? Because the, the Old Testament, the, the, the old law, when, when people failed that law, they received punishment and they received it justly. He says, if that's true, he goes on to say in verse 3, how will we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? The Old Testament was right. The Old Testament was good. The Old Testament was just in its punishment of sinners. But the blood of Jesus is so much better. And if we neglect that, we won't escape. If you neglect, if you this morning, if you're a Christian... And you're not striving daily. I didn't say living perfectly. But if you're not striving daily to follow Jesus, then you're neglecting that salvation. And you can know that you won't escape. If you're here this morning and you're not a Christian according to the way that the Bible tells you to become a Christian, you may be a great person. You may be one of those people that, that we, can, we, we would want to eat with you one day, right? If that, if that was given, I'd love to spend some time with you. I'd love to, to get to know you better. I'd love to admire you and, 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 and get to, to learn from you. But if you're not a Christian, then you're neglecting the salvation that is offered to you. And then a verse that I'd, I'd love for myself to, to memorize and to remember daily. I'd certainly encourage you to as well. First Peter chapter 2 and verse 24. First Peter 2 verse 24. He Himself, Jesus, He bore our sins in His body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by His wounds you were healed. Jesus has been tempted in all ways as we are, but He never sinned. Yet in His death He bore my sins. He bore your sins. He bore the sins of of the world, so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. And because of His wounds, because of the lashings upon His back, because of the, th the thorns digging into His skull, because of the mocking that He experienced, because of the beatings that He took, because of His wounds, we are healed. Because of His sacrifice, we have hope. Unto you a child is born. Again, this, this morning, as I said, this time of year, many people are remembering and recognizing and considering the baby Jesus. The problem is that many of those same people don't want to recognize and remember and serve King Jesus. The baby grew up. He lived perfectly. He died horribly and sacrificially. He resurrected miraculously, and He reigns victoriously. And He invites you to be a part of that kingdom. In Romans chapter 10, verses 10 through 17, it tells us that faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the word of Christ. And, and later it tells us there that, that the, the, we have to hear about Jesus, and, and our faith can lead us to salvation. We have to hear and believe the words about Jesus. Again, we'll talk more about it. How can, we, how can we recognize, how can we how, you know, differentiate the, the facts from the fiction, the stories, the, the accounts from the, the myths? We'll do that on Wednesday night. I, I really encourage you to, to come back to have some of those, answer, those questions answered for you. But you've got to believe that Jesus, God, came to earth, put on flesh, and died for you. And aren't you glad that up from the grave He arose? If He just died, there'd be no hope. But he didn't just die. He came back to life. That fleshly body came back to life. You got to believe that. You got to repent of your sins. Jesus says you have to repent. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Unless you repent, you all, all likewise perish. You'll, you'll perish away from God. You'll perish in a, a place that, that isn't in a right relationship with God. We've got to repent. In Acts chapter 17, verses 30 and 31, it tells us that God has declared to all people everywhere that we must repent. Because He's fixed a day in which He will judge 
the world by Jesus. We've got to have confession. Again, Jesus says that. Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33. Whoever confesses me before men, I'll confess him before my Father who is in heaven. But whoever denies me before men, I'll deny him before my Father who is in heaven. Do you confess Jesus? How often? How often do your actions show that you believe in Jesus? That he is not just a cute little baby that was born and placed in a manger, but that he grew up to be the king of your life? Do you confess Jesus? And then we have to be baptized. Why? Because Jesus says we have to be baptized. Mark chapter 16 and verse 16. Jesus talks about going into all the world and those who believe and are baptized shall be saved. There is salvation in no other name. There's been no other name given among men by which we must be saved. Do you believe in Jesus? Christians, are you living like you believe in Jesus? Is there enough evidence to convict you as a Christian? More, more importantly, not on this earth, but on that day, whenever it is, when Christ returns, will He claim that you are His child? Beyond the shadow of a doubt. If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, but you're not a Christian yet, the Bible, Jesus, God, the church here, myself, I encourage you, why not right now? If you believe that Jesus is the Son of God, you can be saved from your sins right now. Will you repent of your sins? Will you make up your mind that as you learn what God wants you to do, you're going to do your best. You'll mess up, you'll fail, you'll, you will fail, but because of Jesus you can have confidence that you will receive grace and mercy in a time of need. But will you make up your mind, repent, that you, when you learn what God wants you to do, you'll do what He wants you to do. Will you confess Him with your mouth and with your actions every day of your life, again, to the best of your ability? And will you be baptized, come in contact with the blood of Christ that will wash away your sins and that will continually wash away your sins as you confess them to God and ask for forgiveness. God came to die for everyone. Christians, let's live like we appreciate that. Let's live like we recognize that one day, maybe today, Christ will return and judge the world. If you have any needs, we invite you to come as we stand and sing.